Hello, my friends and family. I think everybody's family. If you're listening to this podcast, then you're family. This is episode 64 of Stand Up. I'm Pete Dominic. Joining me today, comedians of Corona, Ted Alexandro and Lori Kilmartin. I don't know why they are the comedians of Corona. It just sounded good because the next couple of episodes, I'm going to be talking with my comedian friends about what it's like to lose all of your work stay home and try to be creative and create content from home, what their concerns are, hopefully have a few yucks. And I've had conversations with a whole bunch of comedians, and I'm just going to try to keep putting them out there on the podcast and on YouTube. I've fired up a YouTube page now where the podcast has been appearing every episode, but now I'm putting video together as well. So go to youtube.com slash stand up with Pete. So how are you doing? Seriously, how are you doing? I mean, how is anybody doing? It's a question that my daughter just walked in. I'm uh, recording a podcast. What do you need? Can I make a salad for you? I'm I'm doing the podcast. No, the one I the salad I always make. Uh, when I'm done here, can I come up and make you a salad? All right, happy to. Anyway, what? Don't take too long. Okay. Sorry about that. I think my studio door needs some WD-40. She probably, she should probably learn how to make her own salad, right? Working from home, I guess that's going to be the norm, everybody. My daughters are home. They have no idea what the hell online schooling is going to be like. Nobody knows the answers to any of the questions is my big observation. We have no idea what this means, what it's going to be. You probably can forecast what it's going to mean for your finances. And if you're like Val and I, you've been completely cleaned out in terms of your work. If you're a freelancer, most industries are affected negatively. We are headed into probably not only a recession, but maybe even a depression. So thank you to all of you who are subscribing with paid subscriptions on Patreon. So many have edited their pledges up to pay more for this podcast. And that means I'm going to up the work, give you plugs. If there's anything that you want to plug, let me know. I'm going to try to put out podcasts every day. I'm even thinking of basically going live all day. I'm trying to figure it out. If we all have to stay in our homes, I'm going to help you navigate it. Stay positive, get informed, be entertained, be enlightened about any number of different issues and ideas and learn together with me about the best course forward psychologically, financially, professionally, and in terms of your health and every other reason. So thanks for sticking with me throughout this. I'm looking forward to talking with more of you. If you find yourself really struggling, don't be shy. Reach out to me. I've been struggling myself with anxiety and depression since the loss of my job back in October. So I've developed some pretty good coping skills. And for some reason, I actually feel a sense of calm during this chaos And maybe a sense of empowerment, like I feel like I might actually be useful and helpful to you right now, and that makes me feel good. So if you're having a tough time, you want to reach out, don't be shy. You've got my email, standupwithpete at gmail.com, and I'd be happy to try to do whatever I can to send you in the right direction, give you some ideas, some advice, whatever I've learned. And also now my wife is offering online sessions, online personal training and health coaching, and you can video chat with her. She's going to be a a cam girl. Did I just say it? Yeah, but it's personal training and she'll come into your space virtually. You can show her your space, whatever equipment you have and whatever your needs are. Email her vvyoga1, the number one vvyoga1 at gmail.com. That's Valerie. And thank you to all of you who are contributing to this podcast and for listening, including my friend David, who is doing his best with his firm to help out. If you've got a Google, if you've got a business, his firm, Swarm Digital, it's a marketing firm, is going to help you for free to update all of the information based on what's going on with the coronavirus. You need to update your Google business. David can help you. And I called him and he told me about it real quick. Here it is. Here's what David can do. Well, thank you, Pete. Yes, Google has been notifying business owners that if their business has been affected at all by coronavirus, that they should be updating their Google My Business profile to communicate with their patrons and their community. Things such as if their hours have changed, make sure their phone number is up to date. 
if they're taking any extra precautions or really any type of communication. And you guys at your company can do it for free right now for anybody that wants to update their business, their hours, whether it's a laundromat, a, a pizza shop, a restaurant, any business on Google, David, you guys are going to be able to help them. We're going to try. We're going to help as many businesses as we have the capacity for. And the way to do this is we published an article on our website. It's at swarmdigital.io slash COVID-19. And the article tells you step-by-step step exactly how to make these updates. But we understand that there's going to be business owners that either don't know how or aren't comfortable making these updates themselves, in which case they can fill out a form. and we will try and see if we can help them for free. Not everyone will qualify, but we're going to help as many people as we can. There you go. You need to change your Google My Business profile because of the coronavirus pandemic. Go to Swarm Digital. This is my friend, David. He's a really good guy. I've gotten to know him well over the years. He's got an awesome company. He and his partners are going to help you. Thank you, sir. Very awesome. Appreciate awesome. it. Thank you so much, Pete. David is a subscriber to my Patreon page, patreon.com slash Pete Dominic. If you want to plug anything on this podcast, whether it be your service, your product, a nonprofit that you like, a book that you read, you want me to say something, read something, then just sign up at Patreon and we will work it out. Patreon.com slash Pete Dominic. And coming up, comedian Lori Kilmartin will join me. But right now, it's my conversation with Ted Alexandro. You can watch this conversation on YouTube at youtube.com slash stand up with Pete. Ted has his own podcast, A Little Bit Me, where he just cold calls comedians and starts recording. It's really great. I did it. I loved it. He's one of my all-time favorite comedians. He's one of the most moral, thoughtful, generous, kind men I've met. He's also a new father. He's got a newborn son who was born on, Jan on December 25th. So we joke a little bit about that and the fact that he looks like a hostage in the video that we made that you can watch at youtube.com slash stand up with Pete. Here's my conversation with Ted Alexandro, the first of the comedians of Corona here on Stand Up. Got just a glass of water. They, they are giving me water. Now talking with hostage Ted Alexandro, who is being held. Who are your captors? What do you know about your captors, Ted? Mm. Who, who, who are, aren't our captors is the, is the <laughs> bigger question. Um, no, I'm safe. They are treating me well. They're treating you okay. Yeah, yeah, for now. Oh, I'm so glad to hear this. Uh, the entire comedy community has been really concerned about your well-being, not to mention all of your fans. So you've Thank got you. water, you've got food. Yep, yep. At least a month's worth of both. Thank you for doing this today, man. I really appreciate it. You were the first, Pleasure, buddy. The first person I wanted to reach out to because you're often the person people look to for comedians in terms of like what the moral you know, baseline should be on things. It doesn't mean you're always right. It doesn't mean everybody agrees. But if anybody, I think a lot of people do look to you, certainly our generation of comedians. And so I, I thought I'd start this conversation with about comics and the situation that we certainly find ourselves in financially with you. Everybody has a different amount. Everybody has different amounts of work, different amounts of money saved up, different needs and bills. So it's not like we're all in the same boat, except for the fact that whether you are, you know, Joe Coy or Bill Burr, Ted, Al Ted Alexander, Pete Dominic, or someone that's just started, you're not getting any work right now. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think that is fair to say right now um, with the coronavirus pandemic being what it is, pretty much everyone I know has stopped working uh, for the immediate uh, future and possibly long-term. It could be three months, it could be longer. So yeah, this impacts what is already a somewhat tenuous financial existence for a lot of us. So let's just talk specifically about your situation. You have a newborn, your son, your beautiful baby boy was yes, born in December on Christmas day, like, the Lord, right? Uh, yes, you're referring to Jesus Christ. <laughs> yes, is there? And, yes, I'm talking about the Son of God. People can draw whatever conclusions they like. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to put that on a newborn, but the stakes are high. 
<laughs> Seems like you've put a lot on this newborn. Uh, <laughs> why have a child right before the beginning of a pandemic? Did you guys discuss that? Do you think you've been responsible as parents in terms of the conception? Yeah, we planned this whole thing out. Uh, an angel came to us and uh, really, we're just, we're just following instructions. <laughs> angel. Was there a gender? Was there a uniform? How would you describe what the angel looked like and how it appeared to you and your wife? It was like an orb of light. It was oh. genderless. Uh, uh, <laughs> a genderless so, orb of light. Yes, yes. Arrived and said, listen. And said, you look, you've got to do this uh, for the humanity. And we said, all right, we're on it. So, <laughs> um, so how are you, what are your personal choices? You had a great Facebook post, which was one of the many impetuses. Is that a word? Is there multiple impetus for? Yeah, impeti? impetus. One of the impeti <laughs> for wanting to call you is I really, you know, I love what you wrote on Facebook in terms of, you know, you live in New York City and right now you've canceled the work that you had left, you were going to be at a theater somewhere with Jim Gaffigan. Did that, is that show still going on? The one that you uh, are not doing? Well, we were actually supposed to be heading to Mexico either this week or next for mm -hmm. a week of shows all over Mexico. Uh, but I canceled that with Jim about two weeks ago, maybe three, maybe yeah, two, two and a half weeks ago. I said to Jim, uh, I don't feel comfortable, you know, with the newborn and all of the uncertainty. So I canceled that. That was one of the first things I canceled and he, uh, he understood. And then uh, in fact, he just came back from, I think he was in Colombia because he's been doing a lot of international dates. So he just came back and cut that short. Uh, but I also canceled. I had like a bunch of um, comedy stellar dates this past week. And I emailed Esty, the, the booker there and uh, told comedy his, club in, in, in New York city, of course. Yeah. Yeah, the Comedy yeah. Cellar, the Village Underground. Uh, yeah, I canceled like four shows there. Just, you know, uh, again, as I, as I wrote in that Facebook post, you know, uh, being the father of a newborn obviously shifts your perspective. I might have been more cavalier in years past. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm obviously, you know, paying more attention to this reading, watching whatever news sources, and uh, just want to err on the side of caution um, and, and try to do what I can to be safe. There are seemingly like two kinds of people or parents right now, those who are acting on an abundance of information and caution and, 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 and those who are maybe thinking that this is fear and panic being driven, I guess, by the media and others for some type of gain and profit. When in effect, I mean, you know, you, you lost money this week. I lost money this week by our choices in terms of canceling the shows we did have. And then, you know, the rest of those decisions are probably being made by the government or these other venues and, and so on in terms of work being canceled. You cited. Uh, I would further break that down into uh, parents who have been visited by angelic orbs of light and those who have not. So. Fair enough. Yeah. And you guys were lucky uh, to have that visit much earlier in the year, just before you conceived your beautiful baby boy, the Lord, the yes. son of God, uh, which is appropriate. But the I second. think, yeah, uh, uh, the, he does have a sibling. <laughs> junior <laughs> sibling. Uh, hi, this is the Lord. This is his brother. Um. You looked, you cited Italy and Iran and I, like, I, I'm not a public health expert either, but we are tracking the same way they are. And they are, they have arguably more, a more of a unifying message. They have obviously a more socialist universal health care in countries like those. So it, it would seem that we are going to be in, in, in a far worse situation yeah. than they are according to what, or at least equal, because the bottom line is you don't know if you've got it. That's like, yeah. that's all you need to know. You don't know if you've got it. Some parents are like, well, you know, we're going to, until we see something, you know, uh, then we're not going to say something. It's like, you're not going to see anything. That, that to me is the main, the main issue is that you're asymptomatic for up to, I don't know what the time limit is, maybe two, two weeks, 10 days. I forget. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, look, none of us are, are really uh, health experts uh, and even the health experts have been somewhat uh caught off guard with this. So I think we owe it to ourselves, to our families, to our communities 
to uh, err on the side of caution, because as you say, like we can't see a you can't see a virus, you know. So in, in a way, this is like even more harmful because like a beautiful sunny day like today where the skies are blue in New York. The temptation is to, you know, I, I was saying to my wife, it's it's almost funny because the very same people who rightly mock Trump for his, uh, oh, look, it's a snowy day. What, you know, what global warming? Yes. Uh, the very same people are now like, oh, it's a, it's the skies are blue. Like what pandemic, you know, like, I guess it's human nature to want to, um, to not panic and to have some kind of control. Uh, well, there's a, yeah. Well, first of all, can your, your son. See the virus? <laughs> uh, if he can, he has not communicated that yet, but uh, that's a possibility. I hadn't considered that. It's, I'm hearing people say, a friend of mine is like, nah, this is fear and panic. You got to be courageous. You can't let fear take over. Totally agree. I've been arguing against my stand-up act. I have a huge chunk about this now, about these helicopter parents that won't let their kids out of their sight. They're worried about a shooting. They're worried about a kidnapping. They're worried about all kinds of things that I think are irrational to some extent, to a great extent. You've got to let your kids be go out and, and, and be independent and, and live their lives or they will live in panic and fear. I don't think I'm doing that. I think that this is, that's why I wanted to talk to you about it. I think this is a moral decision about what to, I'm not afraid of anything but losing money. I'm not afraid of getting sick or my daughter's necessarily getting sick. I'm worried about the people that are more vulnerable. And this is just the right thing to do as a member of a community. It's not about fear or being motivated by by panic. It seems like the right moral choice to do if you're a member of a community of people. That's the way I'm seeing it. Do you agree, disagree? Would you frame it differently? No, I would agree with that. And I do think that something like this, some sort of crisis, a pandemic, uh, anything, you know, that's kind of, uh, large in the scope of it, that is, uh, potentially tragic tends to bring out or, or maybe amplify what your worldview already is. So if you're someone who, um, maybe gets anxious quickly, yeah. uh, that will probably be your response to this. If you're someone who brushes things aside and says like, why is everyone so worried, you know, you'll, you'll pretty much follow suit with, I think it, it will amplify what your worldview tends to be already. Um, but for me, like, I, I think equal measure of, um, you know, concern and uh, taking it seriously is called for in this particular case. I mean, we as comedians, uh, I think we tend to be a little bit skeptical and look for the humor and look for the maybe contrarian point of view uh, with most things anyway, which is healthy and a good coping mechanism. But, you know, as I, as you alluded to, uh, if we look to Italy and Iran and around the globe, you know, clearly this is not to be taken lightly. And I, I think, again, like the response has been probably two weeks slower uh, you know, Italy quarantined like the northern part of Italy. Then within yeah. two days, it was like all of Italy, yeah. you know, and, and the U.S. has been very lax in its response up until probably yesterday. So and, and living in New York City, which is an international city with a constant flow of international travelers, tourists, even the locals who, you know, who travel, uh, myself included, you know, we've been in airports, you know, as you said, with a two week kind of asymptomatic period, who knows how far this thing is traveling all over New York. So um, I think, you know, if, if we can't be overly cautious for two weeks <laughs> in a pandemic, yeah. like when are you going to take things seriously? Like, will you regret being extra cautious? Will you regret that looking back if it turns out to be nothing? And hopefully it will. But, you know, I doubt I doubt that it will. Yeah, I, I can't see how it will not be anything but horrific in terms of what I've read, doctors having to choose who's going to live or die because we don't have enough ventilators, period, end of story. But and I, I also read that the United States, with a considerably smaller population, uh, larger population, rather, has fewer hospital beds than either Italy or I think South Korea. I also think that might go back to some kind of profit driven capitalism thing in terms of hospitals only have enough beds to keep them filled with patients and to keep making money. Same thing with ventilators, certainly with ICU, yeah. ICU units, I've heard. 
Um, I'm, yeah, I'm that's not- certainly the backdrop for for all of this uh, in my mind, for sure. Uh, the the system of capitalism that that commodifies things and the tenuous uh, financial situation that so many people find themselves in now with yeah. a, a freelance gig economy. Um, it just underscores these basic needs that have kind of been mainstreamed in, in recent years, discussing healthcare and discussing discussing uh, potentially universal basic income, or you know, like just yeah, yeah. take a hard look at is this society really taking care of humanity no. as a baseline? Yeah. It is not. No, it I, is not. Do you think I'm going to try to reach out to a whole bunch of comedians for this episode? You are the first person I've reached out to a few other folks. But normally when we do interviews, you know, used to be for kind of local radio or, or, or TV or anywhere else or even a podcast now, you don't really do your your, your actual bits because it's there's no audience. It's forced. It seems hokey. But I do think it might be fun since we're not getting on stage to either talk about the bits we have been doing about the coronavirus and pandemic or even mention uh, ones that others have been doing. Um, do you, since since you're our leader, do you think that that is going to be too hokey for me to ask? How do you feel about me asking you about any of the bits you've been doing about the virus? <laughs> I don't mind at all. I've only, I only did like two nights worth of sets uh, where I did material, but I posted one of them on on Instagram. All right. Uh, well, everybody can go look at that at Ted Alexandro on Instagram. Let me, let me give it a shot. Okay. Uh, I basically said that, like, you know, uh, in times like these, you, you need to get your your news from trusted sources. I'm not talking about the mainstream media. I'm not even talking about independent media. I'm talking, of course, about your conspiracy theory friends. They've got their finger <laughs> on the pulse. They can tell you what needs to be done yeah. immediately and long term. So my friend told me uh, a few weeks ago, you, you need a, a month's worth of food and supplies, get a, a 10 pound bag of rice a five pound bag of beans. And I said, uh, got it. A uh, 10 pound bag of rice, five pound bag, bag of beans. Uh, do you have any recipes? Uh, <laughs> it sounds like a very bland month. You've got, <laughs> there's no doubt the prepping that I did that my wife didn't take quite as seriously as I did. So if we do run low on food, she is going to be stuck with beans, rice, and Canned vegetables, which seem, I mean, I haven't bought canned vegetables since we were little, little kids and, yeah. and, and had no money. I remember my mom bought canned, ve- they're horrific. So yeah, yeah. that's going to be rough. Anything else that you've seen anybody do or any other uh, jokes or humor about the virus? Uh, I haven't really seen too many other people talking about the virus. Yeah. Cause like I said, I only, I only did two sets. Uh, Luckily, I taped them, but yeah, I, I, but I haven't really seen anyone else talk about it. I did ask the crowd just in like a crowd work kind of moment. I yeah. said, uh, make some noise if you have Purell on your person. And of course, the whole place, the whole place went nuts, you know. A friend of mine owns a parking garage and he said in D.C. And he said that someone broke into a car in the garage last night and all they took was the Purell. <laughs> and what's really crazy you said is there was a bowl of diamonds on the passenger seat and still yeah. all they took was the purell so that's that's our current economy the purell economy what do you think uh comedians can i mean how are we how are entertainers I'm specifically talking about comedians because we're comics. I mean, the, the ripple effect in the economy is going to be very far and deep for all kinds of different industry, industries and jobs. But, I mean, we might not work for 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 months. There's just not going to be any, any audiences. I wonder if you've thought anything about kind of creating a community or a support group or, or bringing folks together. I wonder if there's anything that we can do or that you've heard that folks are doing because this is going to be – Really, I mean, you're going to be putting all your best material on Twitter, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but there's no money then. You know, I mean, you need, you need money to pay your bills, right? Well, those of us in the arts, uh, you know, or or zooming out in the uh, the gig freelance economy, are very used to our labor being uncompensated. You know, we have pieces of the pie uh, where we're always giving away work for free, uh, whether it's social media podcasts, uh, much of what we do is, is free, free labor. Um, you're being paid for this. You didn't know. 
<laughs> yeah, I'll, so, I'll, I'll, I'll Venmo you I'll, later. I expect an eight ounce Purell in the mail. Um, uh, but yeah, no, I think, you, you know, uh, we're used to a measure of that, but now we're at a point where we literally won't be able to work for, you know, like you said, an undetermined amount of time, probably months that we're looking at. Um, so it, to me, it just underscores, again, uh, it warrants a larger look at how our whole system is, is set up. You right. know, I think for me personally, for a lot of artists, we, we view this whole system as laughable, as um, depressing, depressing. Yeah. And, and really as homicidal, you know, like as, as it's really, uh, omnicidal, I think is the word that I, that I, I turn to a lot, uh, because it's killing everything. It's killing the, the, uh, the earth, the water, the, the hum, human beings, uh, and those who do live are living in such a tenuous state of uh, anxiety, depression, um, just concerns financially just to, to exist. So yeah, to me, it, uh, it's all tied into, um, what are we going to do about just existing in a, in a more harmonious way? Just as a survey, I, I mean, I don't know how out, how far out you generally book your calendar, if there's some rhyme or reason to that for you and your, in your career, but have you seen a lot of gigs get canceled? I've told everybody, uh, the only gig I have left on the books are, are in June. And I, to be fair, I didn't have anything yet booked for May, but mm -hmm. uh, everything through March and April is gone. Mm. Well, I have the good fortune of uh, opening for Jim Gaffigan. So a lot of my calendar is, is opening for him. It's tied to the gigs that, that he has. So I kind of just fill in my own blanks around that, uh, whether it's at the clubs in New York City or my own headlining dates on the road. So I do have upcoming dates in April in uh, Burlington, Vermont. Uh, and I also have one in May in, uh, in um, Royal Oak, Michigan. So I don't know if those will be canceled or not. And certainly like I, I keep an open mind as to whether I will cancel them, um, you know, just out of concern of like, right not wanting to be away from my wife and son and uh, not wanting to travel in airports and, you know, all this kind of stuff. So I, it's kind of a fluid situation. All right, man. Well, uh, I'm going to check in with you again soon on the air and probably plenty of times off the air. And I appreciate you joining me today. Do you want to share your son with everybody watching? I think he's napping in the other room. So uh, that will have to wait. If but, you were uh, there, would you, what, would you have a moral issue with holding him up in front of a camera? Are you, are you posting pictures of him on social media and stuff? Where are you guys at on that? Yeah, not really. Like we're kind of key. Like we posted when he was born. I think there's maybe one kind of public picture. Uh, but yeah, we're kind of like being on the more kind of uh, conservative side of like yeah. not wanting to turn him into content. You know, I mean, I get uh, I don't judge people who do, yeah. but I also kind of like, there is a little bit of an icky feeling of, um, yeah, just turning him into social media content. Also is it, is part of why you're not seriously, why you're not sharing any, you know, a lot of images publicly is because he's not very cute. <laughs> he, he now, you shared a picture like, with me and I was frankly astonished <laughs> by his appearance and, and concern for him. Like my wife. He looks more like my wife than, than me. So we're, we've dodged the bullet. No, I'm talking <laughs> about the huge beard that he has and how that's a genetic phenomenon. And it's really, really weird that he looks exactly like your head. Now if people want to imagine that's it. Again, it just, to me, it further proves that he is descended from uh, a great point. Lord. Son of Jesus. Yeah. And maybe he can make some money at the freak show at the carnival, baby the beard, with a baby. beard. I don't want to give yeah. you, I don't want to be too capitalist on you. That's not a bad idea given the current situation. I'll keep that in my back pocket. He's a beautiful boy and I'm so glad that you uh, and your wife are his parents. And, uh, you know, I guess Silver Linings, you get a lot of special time with them right now. Hopefully you and, uh, you got to wonder about like couples going at it too. Like when we're cooped up, I wonder how marriages and families are going to, are going to do. I, I think it's a really fascinating time to look at uh, sociologically, so social psychologically in terms of, you know, putting a pause on life and finding, I don't know, making discoveries that you didn't, 
that you hadn't made before in terms of what you can do and how you can find peace and, and, and happiness. Have you thought about that yet that much? I have. Yeah. I mean, honestly, that's my sweet spot. Like I, I love pausing life. <laughs> like it's really, now I don't feel guilty. I've been saying the same thing. I'm like, let's do this. Yeah. It's, it's kind of where I flourish, man. I, I, I don't <laughs> buy into, I don't buy into so much of this forced busyness. And I think for me, I very much like uh, a pace of uh, detaching and just like doing what we've been doing. I said it to my wife the other day. I'm like, I really do feel lucky that I've been here every day, especially at this early, he's two months old, two and a half months. So yeah. uh, to, you know, just have time to play with them and all these little precious moments. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for that silver lining. That's awesome. I'm glad to hear it. All right. I'll let you go. Thank you very much, my friend. I appreciate it. Love you, pal. Love you too. Ted Alexandra, everybody. Go follow him right now on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter. And what other plugs should we give? Uh, What can people buy to support you right now? Albums wise? Yeah, I have albums and all that stuff. TedAlexandra.com. I have a podcast that Pete has been on. Forgive me for not plugging the podcast. Yes. A little bit me. You can find that uh, everywhere. It's a great premise. Explain the premise real quick. Uh, Well, the first half is just me rambling. And then the second half, I call comedian friends unannounced, unscheduled, unplanned. You just uh, cold call comedians and and, and press record. Yes, yes. I ask them, do you want to be on, on my podcast? They invariably say, sure, when? And I say, we're recording right now. The it's great. And the craziest thing is that when I found out that you were doing that, I, I just was waiting and starting to feel insecure and and hoping. And I was like, you know, it's not the kind of thing that you could ask anybody to book you for. It's like Ted just thinks of you for whatever reason. And then he calls you. You can't have like an agent or something like, could you uh, tell Ted Alexandro that I'm free? And you, I feel like you, mu- you do it somehow organically. And so you waited till you found out that I lost my dream job of 12 years. You called maybe a couple days after I announced that. And yeah. you, a- a- and, um, you opened with something like, I figured you had some free time. <laughs> and it was really great. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, you know, it, it is very much an organic thing. I, I don't plan it. And, and I, actually, you know, people who have asked me, I, I have not called. Have people asked? A couple of people have said, can I, you know, can I do it? Like, anybody I, respectable? I would never ask you to say their name, but anybody that you would say is, you know. Yeah, no, the people I respect, but they had something to promote or whatever. And I was just like, <laughs> I just, I just scroll my phone and I call people. Right. It's not about, you know. You know, maybe I'll get to them eventually, but it's kind of, I'm like, yeah, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to like fulfill your PR needs. <laughs> ah, that's great. A little bit me podcast. Yeah. Go listen to it now. You can thank me later for introducing you to Ted if you weren't already familiar with him. Oh, I should mention this real quick. My, uh, my BFF is in Australia, a guy named David Campbell. I, I polo with him every day. That's something everybody should get the Marco Polo app. It's real fun, especially for male friendship. Uh, because we don't always have the best conversations because you don't know how, what to say sometimes. So you just say stuff into the camera and you send it and then they send it back. Anyway, he is a monster fan of yours down in Australia. He's a famous singer and television anchor down there. And he just always talks about Ted Alexandro. And uh, so if people aren't fans uh, in, in uh, internationally listening, check it out. It translates. David Campbell. David Campbell. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you, David. I'll, I'll, I'll check him out. Appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, you got to tweet him. He'll be over the moon. That'd be funny. Nice. All right, man. Thank you very much. I'll talk to you soon. My pleasure, Pete. Thank you, pal. All right. That is Ted Alexandro. Follow him on Twitter, Instagram, tedalexandro.com. Watch his videos on Instagram. Really, really funny stand-up comedian. That guy and a few others led the charge, the movement to get more money for comedians out of New York City comedy clubs like 15 years ago. Really great guy. Very, very, very smart, funny, moral, love him to death. All right, now we go to uh, Lori Kilmartin. But before we do, I do want to plug a couple of other things that uh, folks that subscribe on Patreon asked me to do, including for Amy, who wanted me to plug the Fistula Foundation, which is a nonprofit medical agency 
with clinics in Africa and Asia who provide life-changing surgical procedures for women with debilitating childbirth injuries. There you go, Amy. That's the Fistula Foundation, F-I-S-T-U-L-A foundation.org. Also, James Grote designs apps. He is a Patreon subscriber at patreon.com slash Pete Dominic. He has an iOS game. You've got nothing else going on, right? You're sheltering at home. You're out of ideas. You're bored. Play Scribble Ball. Billiards with paint for iPhone and iPad. Download Scribble Ball right now. That's James' company. Keith Desa is at the Navy Federal Credit Union, and they help out folks in the military, anybody in the Four Corners region of the U.S. looking to buy a home, contact Keith. Go to NavyFederal.org or call him at 877-573-2324. That's Keith Desa. And what else can I plug for you? That's it. All right, let's get to my friend Lori Kilmartin right now. She's on Twitter at AnnieLori16. Check her out at Kilmartin.com. And here's our conversation, which went all over the place, and I really enjoyed I have one of my all-time favorite comedians as far as stand-up. I've always loved watching her do stand-up, but I just got to say, she's so good on Twitter as well. Everybody should follow her on Twitter and watch her do stand-up everywhere that she's performing, and she's constantly touring, although we're all sidelined. Ladies and gentlemen, Lori Kill Martin right now on the phone with me, at AnnieLori16 on Twitter, L-A-U-R-I-E. Hi. Oh, my God. Thanks for spelling Lori. Uh, you, that's a huge problem for a lot of people. So uh, thank you, Pete. It's so great to hear your voice. I've been listening to your podcast, and I love it. And uh, I love how you're handling everything by speaking about it. It's amazing. Um, so Probably should. Huge, thank, you. thank you very much. Let me mention your podcast, podcast as well, Jackie, the Jackie and Lori show. You do it with uh, comedian Jackie Cashian. You also have a great book, Dead People Suck. And I'll plug Thanks. all those things again, but uh, <laughs> but I'm psyched to have you here. And you're in. So so tell people generally, normally, what your your life is like. You have a son. You work in L.A. You're a writer, but you also tour a lot. So you're you're traveling. It seems quite a bit. Uh, yeah. Um. It's I'm I work for Conan, so I'm mostly in Los Angeles. And uh, then when we have hiatus weeks, I hit the road. So uh, right now I'm in New York and the spots are almost zero. There's a right. couple clubs still open and the tables are like 10 feet apart. It's a really surreal. Like I, I did a show for about 12 people last night. You at did? A major comedy club. Yeah. How, how, what was it like? <laughs> Who were the people there? Uh, I, I don't know. I didn't. Um, I just kind of did a quick set and it, there weren't a lot of people there and they were everyone was sort of sitting far apart. It wasn't, you know, right. comedy is better when everyone's on top of each other and that's not happening now, or is it going to happen in, for a long time? So it's, it's really strange what the dynamics of performing are going to be like, even when everything's quote back to normal. So it's great that you have a job as a writer on Conan's television show, but you supplement obviously your income doing stand up as we all do yeah. And have you seen like pretty much everybody else has your next, I don't know, month or so just canceled, postponed, rescheduled? Pre- yeah, pretty much. Pretty much every spot um, is canceled. Yeah. I, I can't. Yeah. What are we supposed to do? <laughs> I don't know. Um, it's weird. Like I, I've, I'm always complaining that I just don't have any time for anything. And um uh, I'm always crowded. You know, my mother lives with me and my son, uh, but I happen to be away from them for like three days and here in New York. And it's really strange because I, I now I want to be near them a little bit. And I, I don't know, it's, it's a, it's not the heaven I thought it was going to be. <laughs> <laughs> the time having the time. Right. Yeah. When, right. When, when do you, uh, when do you go back? Um, so let's go back on Wednesday. Mm. Um, I, I, even then I'm like, should I just be leaving now? Or, I, mm. I, or you don't want to be in an airport right now, seeing all the people coming in from the international flights. Is that going to get better this week or, or stay awful? I, I really don't know. I'm sort of like, uh, 
reevaluating everything every four hours. Every four hours. Yeah, it's it's nuts. Now, what about your mom? Live, like, how, how old is your mom? How is your mom's health? Do you worry about there's a lot of people that have their parents or in-laws living with them? I mean, you worry about bringing bringing home your spit to her? Um, well, you had mentioned that you wanted to hear coronavirus jokes at some yeah, point. Yeah, yeah. I definitely want to get to any material this, you have. This goes right into my chunk where um, basically I just wipe down the mic. You know, I bring Lysol wipes on stage. Right. And I tell people I want to get the coronavirus, but not from not from male comics. <laughs> it's, it would be the most viral form of the coronavirus, right? Uh, yeah, for uh, sure. I do want to get it and I bring it home to my mother because at 82 with respiratory problems, she's she's in the 20 percent. Oh, my God. And oh, dear. Because <laughs> nothing kills her. Honestly, Pete, she has <laughs> the stuff she has science can treat like she has blood clots but she's got stents and every fucking artery part pardon me every artery and so you know even though it looks like a bowling alley inside of her body none of those clots <laughs> get her so this is my only hope so i'm i'm the rare corona optimist what else do you have i mean how much how much material can you do how many corona uh viral infection pandemic jokes can you do uh, before it's like, okay, can you change the subject to something else? It's almost like Trump material. It's like, yeah, I, 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 I'm trying to get away from the chaos and the terrifying shit. I know. Well, I think if you're physically addressing it on stage by either not touching the mic or like I put, um, I got some foam covers that I'm just throwing on mics or at least I put on one last night. I mean, you, I think it is kind of helpful to address why you're swabbing down for heart surgery before you tell a joke. Right, right. <laughs> you know, you know, it's it, it's just like it's like when you whenever you perform in England, you know, if you're an American, they go, well, the first thing you have to do is take the piss out of being an American. Right. And party's like, well, I don't I don't want to be told what my first joke has to be. I'll 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 say what I want. And then you go up on stage and you don't mention being American and you're like, oh, all right, I I will take your advice next time. Um, But I I don't like being forced to do a joke first, but I think it it helps a little bit. It seems like right now this is the ultimate shared experience. I mean, that's what comedy is. Shared experiences. Have you, you know, heard this, experienced this? And everybody right now is having a shared experience, Lori, that none of us have really ever even thought about having. Isolating, quarantining, you know, worrying about every sniffle and whether or not there's going to be food in the grocery store. Right, right. Yeah, it's really, it's really weird. What's your uh, scariest thought track that you go down? Do you do, or do you, maybe you don't do that. Maybe you stop yourself. Maybe you're mentally healthier. I don't know. Um, I know I, I follow a lot of threads that are, that are very disturbing, you know, for like epidemiologists and, and people like that. Um, I'm sure it's the same stuff you are following too, where, where they're describing Italy and you're like, yeah. uh, that's going to be here in a week. Are you fucking kidding me? That's crazy. Yeah. But I, you know, I believe them that, that it, it can happen that quickly. What do you think of these people that are going out and partying and drinking and hanging out at bars and stuff? I mean, shouldn't we be shaming them? Shouldn't we be going by the bar when there's a whole bunch of 20 year olds out there and just heckling them to go home? <laughs> yeah. I mean, yes, it, that's not good. On the other hand, you have to those, that's our first audience when the quarantine's over. So that's a good point. That's a good we, point. We have to gently, gently shame them. You know, it's, it's, I mean, they, they're, I guess the recommendations should be more clear, you know? And I mean, it, it, it's also, I, I can't believe what I saw last night when I went out to two comedy clubs was mm-hmm. there was not that kind of closeness that there is at the mm-hmm. bars. I, the pictures I saw in Chicago, everyone's sort of staying away and um, the ta- people are sitting really far apart and not, I don't know, people seem to be very conscious of it. And even on the train too, you know, everyone's, yeah, oh, really? everyone's covered. People are not sitting near each other. It it wasn't that experience in New York last night. What other experiences? I mean, walking around New York City, what's, oh, it, I mean, is it, is it eerily It was quiet? very empty. Um, when I came on the plane, uh, I took the red eye out on Friday night. You know, most people were wiping down their seats and stuff. And I had, I had Clorox wipes and I 
you know, I swabbed the whole row and all the trays and everything like that. And I put a, I had a, I have a mask, I had a mask from, I, you know, I have a wildfire kit for California. So I had a mask. So I wore that on the ride out here and, um, gloves and I didn't eat anything. Um, and I just, uh, it, it, it enabled me to not touch my face and stuff like that. Um, yeah, that's smart. I, 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 uh, all I do is put my fingers all over in my face, my mouth, and in my nose. It's I'm disgusting. It's, you, you know, um, I have like if, even if you don't have a mask, I have a bunch of eye shades, especially you get them from JetBlue when you take their red eyes, and you can also use that as a mask just to put over your mouth. Not that it'll it'll stop you from touching your mouth, as opposed to you know it's not gonna it's not like a N95 mask to protect you from a virus, but it stops you from getting right. contagion yourself. I guess if that's a word. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. Uh, contagion. <laughs> Is I'll that take a it. word? I don't know. I don't know, but I make them up every t- every broadcast. So now there's some concern. Now you have uh, a deep concern because you tweeted yesterday that you you have a real issue because you don't actually know how to cook. <laughs> that was uh, I I don't know how to cook, and um, I. Uh, I burn everything and I just may end up making toast a lot. And, uh, so far that's worked for me, but I feel like, uh, this is like one of those golden opportunities to learn something you don't know how to do. And like, I have not Instapot sure. and I've never op- tried it. It's, it's like sparkling brand new, but it's six months old. And, um, a lot of people responded with recipes that, uh, were terrifying to me, like the, the words and the amounts and the measuring, it just made me want to, to run away. Uh, what happened to you? <laughs> Why did you never learn to make food as a as a young lady, as an adult? Is it what is it? Why are you opposed to it, or do you not intimidated I, by oh, it? Okay, I guess there's three. By the way, I am too. I mean, I'm 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 just but sure. I'm interviewing you. Like I I don't love I don't like doing it. I don't like preparing and cooking food. But uh, but I'm not and I'm pretty bad at it. But so what, what's your um, story? Three things I would say. A lot of women have food issues, and so making good food is um, for yourself is sort of uh, a a way to take care of yourself that a lot of women aren't good at doing. You know, it's like you're not allowed to have food. You're not allowed to eat in front of people. You have to look – you're supposed to be wanting to be thin, so food is – it's not – it's not a way to comfort yourself in front of people. So that leads to binge eating. And, you know, a lot of any woman with an eating disorder, which is probably a lot of us, uh, or have that history, you have a different relationship with food. It's, it's, you know, it's not, um, you're not used to treating yourself to it. It's either a a thing you do furtively in the middle of the night while everyone else is asleep and then do sparingly in front of witnesses. Right. So that's one issue. So I never learned to like, make something I enjoy for myself because I never valued, uh, making myself happy Two is I, I've been a road comic for so long that, um, that you just, if you, I guess if you didn't learn to do it early on, you're, you're, you just get used to going to subway or whatever and, and making simple stuff. Uh, and you know, if you're at a gig for like two nights, you're not going to go to the grocery store and stock up for two nights. So you just end up, doing what's easiest and what's easiest is anything you can get downstairs at the hotel, you know, um, little store and microwave. And, um, and three is, uh, I think my mom was, my mom was a homemaker and a cook and I so much resented her and didn't want to be like her that I didn't learn anything considered female because I thought that would make me, uh, weaker. (laughs) So, uh, I just, you know, and I was heading, heading, going headfirst into a, um, a profession where there was hardly any women and you had to act like a man the whole time. So that fit right into what I had, was trying to reject anyway. You've been really outspoken and vocal about equality for women in general and certainly in, in entertainment and then in comedy. And I've interviewed you even about that sub- subject before. We've talked about it before. But how do you think, where do you think we're at, you know, now in, in 2020? How much has changed in the last couple of years, if if anything, in terms of opportunity, in terms of treatment, money, et cetera? Um, so I, think, I think it's better for female writers. I think for female stand-ups, if you look at club lineups, it's not that much better. Um, and I think there's a bottleneck of really funny women that are are unable to rise above the feature 
position because, you know, a, a, a club would rather hire an unknown white guy than an unknown female comic. If they're going to, if they're going to have a week where it's not a YouTube star or a really famous comedian, you know what I mean? Like <laughs> yeah. they're like, well, we'll chance, yeah, we'll chance the white male, but we won't chance the female. Um, so, uh, you know, that's how you get better and is by people going, yeah, you can have this week that no one shows up at anyway. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's, uh, it's a rodeo week and no one goes to comedy club. So you can headline that week. And that's how you start to get to be a good headliner. And I think a lot of really funny women are ready to jump in there in that position. And there's, they're not, getting them because the clubs would rather quote, take a chance on a white guy thinking, well, at least people thinking there would, there'd be a problem with an audience showing up, I guess, or it's laziness or they're uncomfortable with women, you know, some of these bookers. Well, how about, you know, just blaming society and the public in general when, when the comedy club says, well, if I'm going to book an unknown white guy or an unknown uh, woman, white woman, woman or or guy, I'm going to, because there's a stigma that women aren't as funny, I'm just going to go with the guy because people are more likely to buy tickets for a guy, a male comedian than female comedian. How much of it is a reflection of just society and, and, and gender inequity when it comes to entertainment to begin with in terms of buying tickets? Possibly. I mean, um, I mean maybe a club could change that by, by you know, booking more women and, 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 and proving over and over how hilarious they are. Well, and, it's, I, I, it I don't feel like, like it's the onus on the women to prove that they're hilarious anymore. I mean, if you're a comic on stage, you're, you're going to try to kill as hard as you can. And I think it's weird. People do audience members do check people out on YouTube before they come to the show. So people are doing right. their due diligence. I really do think it's um, more booker laziness and it's, it's a lot of old, older men that are comfortable around men and they, they, I feel like it's, Booker's attitudes towards women more than it's the audience's attitudes towards women. Cause I, I, I mean, I haven't had that experience and I, I know that a lot of female comics, I know when they go out on the road, they, they do really well, you know? And so in terms of numbers and everything. So, uh, I, yeah, I, I do feel like sure. it's Booker laziness, uh, has at least as a partial culprit uh so you've also pay you pay really close attention to politics i i feel like i've seen you tweet along with the debates and you're you're really a big it seems like a really big bernie sanders supporter what do you think what do you make of you know uh, everything now seems like you know pre-trump post-trump like pre-9-11 post-9-11 and then pre-pandemic post-pandemic but in between kind of Trump's election and what you've seen over the last three years in terms of the Democrats that have been running. I mean, was there anybody that you were following and supporting more than Bernie Sanders at any one point? Where do you think we're at right now at the uh, mid-March before the final, well, not final, a debate between Biden Um, and Bernie? Yeah, I was a Warren supporter. I switched over to Bernie after she dropped out. Yeah. Interesting. Why, Why did you switch to Bernie after Warren? Or what? why did you support Elizabeth Warren? Uh, I thought she was highly capable. I thought because she organized the consumer f- financial, I can never remember the name of that. I, I can't don't know either. This, I think it's CFPB, yeah, it's Consumer Protection, yes. CPFB, Consumer Protection Financial Bill, whatever. Yeah. It, yeah, I I'm so glad that that's your answer. Go ahead. Yeah, I agree. I started supporting her then too because we all were getting screwed by the right, the bank. Right, and I feel like she, she, she also it. has a ability to spot weaknesses in and like legislation pretty early and fix it or, or call attention to it. And, um, I, I was very impressed by that. And I just thought she was completely ready to be, uh, the president. And, um, you know, I, uh, after she dropped out, there were just really two choices and, um, you know, I, Bernie wouldn't be my, I think of the two he'd be, he, he, what he had in plan for America was way better than what Joe Biden is. Right. <laughs> in the end, if Biden gets the nominee nomination, you're of voting course. for him. And, and what would you say to somebody who said he's not progressive enough and I'm sitting out, you know, I, uh, he's not. And, um, I understand, you know, you, you could not vote for him and then vote down ballot. I mean, it, it feels like 
you know, the the way that America is going to change and become and have Medicare for all and provide these services that are kind of essential and every other country does is from the ground up, from local communities, from the House of Representatives, from the Senate. Like we slowly that those bodies need to be pushed. And if you look at the results of the 2018 election, there was a lot there's a lot of that happening and it feels like that that's going to that's going to happen again in 2020 where more uh, socialist or democratic socialist uh, people are running for office and are getting the support right. they need. So I, I think, you know, that stuff moves the needle. And if you look at where Bernie, uh, you know, I, I voted for Hillary in 2016 in the, excuse me, I voted for Bernie in the primary to move Hillary to the, to the left a little bit. And he definitely has pushed the Democratic Party to the left and awakened a sensibility in um, younger voters, which is great. And it's just going to keep going yeah. further. It's not happening as fast yep. as it needs to. And it's not happening as fast as it should for a lot of people right now who are living on the margins. And that's that's awful. But it is happening. I also think that. This pandemic will push people to the left when it comes to things like health care and paid sick leave when you understand that it affects everybody all the way up to the wealthy. Yeah, Slate just had a great article on stuff that it's like, oh, oh, if we can change these rules so quickly, that means these rules didn't need to be in place where it's like Walmart all of a sudden is offering two weeks of paid sick leave. Like you, you obviously you, they could have done that decades ago, you know, if they can do it on a dime right now. Um, the TSA is allowing 12 ounces of Purell on a plane. Well, then it's no <gasps> big deal. All all 12 ounces of anything is no big deal. Like all these things that are just become rules to annoy people or, or just to make more money in terms of like not offering sick leave. Well, they're not, they're not absolutely necessary if they can be flipped in a second. Um, so hopefully, hopefully some of those rules will stay. And if they don't, people will vote to make them stay. What is the issue that you, that most motivates you that you're most passionate about? Is it healthcare? Yeah, I guess it, I guess it would be healthcare. It's weird because I have I have great healthcare. So I have healthcare through the Writers Guild, um, and um, you know my son is on my healthcare, but you know he he won't be when he after he's age 26. So in terms of my own personal personal life, it's like for my kid. And then just, I have so many, we all, you and I have so many friends that don't have any sort of health care. So many comic friends that are just basically barely making it. And so, you know, just, just for them. Yes, of course. And then for, uh, just societal, you know, health, uh, every, everyone should have great health care. Everyone should be able to, you know, get, thing, get well. The thing that's so that frustrates me so much is that after I lost my job at Sirius, I lost my health insurance. My wife's an independent contractor. And so now I'm, you know, we're on the open market on oh, the exchanges fuck. and our, and, and, and it's, and it's nuts. And because, you know, I'm not in the after union anymore, but there, I'm so happy because I found out that the, you know, because of the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, you, you get subsidies to pay for your health insurance if you aren't making a certain amount of money. And that looks like it's the case that we're going to be in, at least Thank temporarily. God. And that's what irks that. Yeah, but that's what bothers me so much about these, you know, Bernie supporters who are so mad that things are incremental and that we don't get everything we want. I get that. I totally understand. I'm as far to the left as we get. But if we didn't have Obamacare... My family would be screwed exactly. right now. Yeah. And so what we did get is huge. It was really hard fought to get. And and a lot of capital was lost and they got demagogued forever. So it's like, yeah, we just got to keep trying to get more uh, affordable health care and more fair health insurance and equitable and so on. But but like where we're at now, th I'm so happy that we at least have mm -hmm. that. And and we just got to keep fighting. So it just irks me when people sit here and be like, well, we don't have Medicare for all. Well, yeah, let's get there. But what we did win should be counted is, I guess, my point. Yeah, I agree. And I and the the thing that always, you know, troubles me, even with if we'd had Warren in, as a as a president, is you you have to get legislation passed. Joe Manchin. Right. Uh, and that guy is a Democrat uh, in name only. He's from West Virginia and he voted for Kavanaugh. And nothing. I mean, the, the amount of compromise you have to go through at the moment, the way the Senate is currently currently structured um, will not allow a blanket Medicare for all immediately. Um, unfortunately, you know. 
uh, but we'll just see maybe maybe the Senate will flip in in such a way that we w- you know we wouldn't have to compromise for the likes of Mansion. but it it seems really impossible the way things are structured right now in Congress, you know. That's a realistic thought. That's civics, that's <laughs> politics. And I think a lot of people just don't just don't understand that necessarily, but yeah, I don't know. All right. Well, I appreciate you talking to me today, Laurie. You're one of my all-time faves and such a great human being and, and a real, I think, I think you're a role model in comedy. I think what you are doing to fight for gender equity and uh, in, in, in all ways is uh, to be, to be really respected. Here. I don't know. I, I, you know, thank you. I, I just consider myself selfish and I'm fighting for myself, but, for, for, you know, like trying to help other women is also helping no. myself, really. So uh, it's not it, my motivations are not. Altruistic. Whatever you say, I boss. Apologize. I'll take them. <laughs> all right. Good luck learning to cook, as we all do. <laughs> I've had fri- uh, chicken in the fridge for like a week and I'm not sure if it's still good. I don't know anything either. So if I don't talk to you. I got salmonella. <laughs> I'll know what happened during the uh, outbreak. <laughs> it, would be, it would be a shame for you to die of salmonella during a coronavirus outbreak. It's like the people that died on a car in it, a car crash on September 11th. Would like, it you be? Definitely want to die of of Corona now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. It's a great point. Thank you, Lori. Thanks, Pete. Bye. Okay, that's Lori Kilmartin earlier. Ted Alexandro, please let them know that you heard him here on the Stand Up with Pete Dominic podcast. Thank you again to all of the new subscribers on Patreon. I really appreciate that so much. I look forward to hearing from you and building this community. We're going to try to post things every single day here on the podcast. Some of them you'll like and want to listen to. Other ones you might not be as interested in. But you tell me who you'd like to hear from. Right now, I'm really curious to see how the situation is going to be with groceries and grocery stores. I'm also curious about online education as well as all the other obvious healthcare facilities, healthcare worker concerns. But what do we need to learn about what is happening right now in our communities? Who are the experts I should be talking to? Uh, As always, I want your feedback. So hit me up right now on Twitter, on email, standupapete at gmail.com. I'll talk to you tomorrow. And we'll have more of the comedians of Corona, Jessica Curson, Mike Kaplan, maybe others. Stay safe. Stay sound. Stay in touch. I'm Pete Dominic. We'll talk to you later.